If you think you already know how the story of ice and fire ends, guess again, because the winds of winter are blowing. Out beyond the city walls, the distant thump of a trebuchet releasing could be heard. Dead men and body parts came spinning down out of the night. One crashed amongst the pit fighters, showering them with bits of bone and brain and flesh. Another bounced off the chain maker's weathered bronze head and tumbled down his arm to land with a wet splat at his feet. A swollen leg splashed in a puddle, not three yards from where Selmy sat waiting on his queen's horse. The pale mare, murmured Tom Colo. And that is just a taste of the kind of stuff that awaits us in the winds of winter. Flying corpses and fear. And fear. <laughs> hey everyone, I'm here with Lucifer Means Lightbringer, atop the high tower of Old Town, as you can see. And we're here to bring you the 23 most anticipated winds of winter plot lines. That's right, over the next 23 days, starting right now, we'll be releasing videos alternating between both of our channels, covering all of the awesome stuff that's coming in A Song of Ice and Fire, Book number six, from Jon Snow's Resurrection to Euron Greyjoy's Apotheosis. So make sure you subscribe to both of our channels so you don't miss anything. And those links will be in the description, of course. And with that said, let's do a quick setup for what's going on at the Battle of Fire right now. Fire! <laughs> and of course, people have done a lot of very long, excellent, in detailed analysis of all the military factors at play, but um, you know, all these videos are going to be pretty short. What we're trying to do basically is just set the stage so that you guys know what to look forward to and what the potential winter. possibilities are. Exactly. And so just to give you the quick layout of the forces, of course, we've got Danny's forces being led primarily by Barristan, uh, you know, leading everyone except for the Unsullied. And then, of mm -hmm. course, Grey Worm leading the Unsullied. And the first action that they're doing is they're essentially charging out of the city. If you remember, they had been penned up by all the various allies of the slavers, essentially, from Volantis to Nugis and everywhere. And they essentially decide that they can't sit there and let them just fling corpses over the walls, and so Barristan leads a charge. You have to go out and fight, and you got the Unsullied waiting to charge the Giscari legions under Bloodbeard, uh, Barristan doing his thing, and it's pretty intense right now. Right, and of course, we're referring to actually the, um, a couple of those Tiwau chapters. A lot of the information we have on the Battle of Fire comes from both the Barristan Tiwau chapter and the Tyrion, Tyrion yes. Tiwau chapter. So we're going to be pulling from both of those. And that's where we got that last quote. And essentially the, the point of the Barristan's charge is he's charging at one of those catapults to sort of fracture the lines and clear some space for the Unsullied, unsullied to form up. And that is what is happening right there. And they're going to charge, I guess, the Giscari legions under Bloodbeard. And we also got Victarion showing up with all of his ships in the harbor I and also his ship in the harbor. <laughs> and also the dragon binder and there's all, all sorts of potential possibilities of what could happen there. And you know we're gonna talk about Dragon Binder. And of course, so of course we'll that. Yes. And we've got Dario, he's a captive. Um, I think Dario has plot armor at least for the meantime, so we should be seeing him in the mix. Hopefully he'll get freed so he can do some violence. We've only seen him do a little bit of violence. He seems like he likes to do a lot of violence. Yeah, I, I want to see him like go off on, <laughs> in, on the battlefield. Let's I'd like get, to see that. I would love to see a Dario rampage. That would be great. Um, so we've got Viserion and Regal, of course. They're flying through the air. They're actually eating some of those corpses. We're going to get to that quote in a second. Mm -hmm. It's a really visceral one, if you will, Viserion. Uh, and so then we've got Shave Pate and the Pit Fighters. They're holding the city by themselves. I'm sure nothing could go wrong there. Yeah. <laughs> Their loyalty is questionable. Very questionable. To say the least. Yes, to say the least. And the slaver army, essentially, they've, you know, they're surrounding the city. It looks like a bad situation, but as soon as they go out and start poking it, we see that they're very fragmented. We get that look uh, behind the lines with Tyrion, and we can mm -hmm. see there's like, you know, a, a bunch of kings and no unified commander. Yeah. Everyone's going their own way. It's obvious that there's no cohesive command structure going on. So it's kind of much like the soldiers on stilts. Mm -hmm. They look impressive from a distance, but if you just sort of push them over, it's like they just collapse. Exactly, yeah. And so that's that's essentially what's happening. And that's, again, why we're not one of the reasons why we're not going to try to go into all the detail. It's easy to see the broad strokes of the way this is going. So the way that it's headed is is essentially a victory over the slave army. That seems clear. And most likely what we're going to get is the three people 
Tyrion, Barristan, and Victarion in charge of Meereen and waiting for Danny. And we look forward to George writing all kinds of delightful dialogue there, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure there'll be a lot of really interesting back and forth between all of them, for sure, because they're all very interesting characters with a lot of different stuff going on. And we're actually going to break down all three that sort of three-way dynamic and talk about what each person is going to think of mm-hmm. the other. So let's right now give another taste of the battlefield. Uh, I mentioned corpses flying through the air, and here's some more of that. Far across the city where the shadowed steps of Marine's Great Pyramid shouldered 800 feet into a starless sky, a fire had awoken where once the harpy stood, a yellow spark at the apex of the pyramid. It glimmered and was gone again, and for half a heartbeat Sir Barristan was afraid the wind had blown it out. Then it returned, brighter, fiercer, the flames swirling now, yellow, now red, now orange, reaching up, clawing at the dark. Away to the east, dawn was breaking behind the hills. Another thousand voices were exclaiming now. Another thousand men were looking, pointing, donning their helms, reaching for their swords and axes. Sir Barrison heard the rattle of chains. That was the portcullis coming up. Next would come the groan of the gate's huge iron hinges. It was time. The red lamb handed him his winged helm. Barristan Selmy slipped it down over his head, fastened it to his gorget pulled up his shield, slipped his arm inside the straps. The air tasted strangely sweet. There was nothing like the prospect of death to make a man feel alive. May the warrior protect us all, he told his lads. Sound the attack. All right, so if that doesn't get you ready for battle, I don't know what will. Like, Sir Barrison is so epic, and, you know, this is shaping up to be a really big battle because, like, compared to the show, it was very much like get in, get out. But there's a lot more going on here, and it's going to be a lot more intense and epic, and I'm so ready for this. And that's going to be a theme we're going to hit again and again, where there's a little bit of a feeling like, oh, we mostly know what happens, a couple things might be different, but a lot of things are going to be different. And seeing them happen in a bigger, more expansive way is just, I mean, it's like drinking cheap wine versus, you know, drinking good wine or exactly, something like that. And right? So, and, you know, no slight intended, but it's just, you can do this in the longer book format. There's more detail. There's more, you know, more corpses flying through the yeah. air over the walls and scaring everyone with the pale mare. And You know, also here we get to see firsthand, like, how badass and awesome Barris and Selmy is and why he's legendary. So that's really great, and that's something that was also left out of the show, really. Yeah, Barristan fell flat and then kind of got a punk death there in the alley. All right, so let's get into our first big question. How will the dragons affect the battle? Because they are the wild card here. That's right. We can, like it's, like we were talking about earlier, we can see that the slaver army is not going to hold together very well. Barristan and the Unsullied are probably going to wreak some havoc. They're going to free Dario. Dario's going to slaughter like 300 people. Mm-hmm. So the dragons are really the, the X factor. And as, as you can see, just as soon as they start flying through the air, everyone starts, you know, pooping their pants and rightfully so. So um, here is a good quote to sort of give you that feel. And this is Tyrion's point of view. And he's in the camp of the Second Sons, I believe. And everyone sort of looks up and sees the dragons enter the fray. Something's happening. He went outside to discover what it was. Dragons. The green beast was circling above the bay, banking and turning as long ships and galleys clashed and burned below it but it was the white dragon the cell swords were gawking at. Three hundred yards away, the wicked sister swung her arm up. Chunk, thump, and six fresh corpses went dancing through the sky. Up they rose, and up and up. Two burst into flames. The dragon caught one burning body just as it began to fall, crunching it between his jaws as pale fires ran across his teeth. White wings cracked against the morning air, and the beast began to climb again. The second corpse caroomed off an outstretched claw and plunged straight down to land amongst some Yunkish horsemen. Some of them caught fire too. The horse reared up and threw his rider. Others ran trying to outrace the flames and fanning them instead. Tyrion Lannister could almost taste the panic as it rippled out across the camps. And so you can really see in this section that as far as like the dragons are concerned, it's just like chaos for everybody. Everyone's afraid of the dragons. It's because Danny isn't there to like keep them in check, right? So it's like we don't know who these creatures are going to attack and eat. They can't tell who the good guys are and who the bad guys are. So it's kind of like everyone just has to like kind of stay out of their way and avoid them. And they're creatures of fire and blood. And we've seen multiple times that they're drawn 
to the, the action, right? Loud noise, screaming, smell of blood, burning things. Like the dragons are like, mm, it smells like a dragon party, and they're coming out. So, Serion and Regal are having the best times of their lives. They're, right now. <laughs> they're living their best lives right yeah. now. They've made layers up in the pyramids, and yes. So, you know, the first big question as far as, well, what will they do on their own? Second big question is, what about Dragonbinder? Because, of course, uh, in the Victorian sample chapter, they're just about getting ready to blow it. He's got mm-hmm. three sl- uh, slaves that are ready to essentially give their lives to blow this horn. Mokoro's instructing him. We have no idea what's going to happen. If Euron has you know, probably claimed it already, yeah. if it's going to backfire, if Euron's going to let Vic use it, mm-hmm. if it just has certain effects. I mean, it just is so many possibilities with the horn is blown. It, it'll be very curious to see what the dragon's reaction to the horn is. Right, because they could, I don't know, like calm down and like bow before him, maybe, or like fly away. There's a lot of potential things that could go down. Like they could just like kind of react to it, but then not much happens. Well, it'd essentially be like Unicron paging Megatron with the, like, like the piercing. <laughs> ah, why or, Megatron? Or why Unicron? All right. So, <laughs> in any case, uh, we've got um, Tyrion running around. That's another, as far as a way to get a hold of the dragons, which again, are completely uncontrolled right now. Tyrion's dragon knowledge has been built up the whole time. He stole those books, not stole, but he borrowed the books from the Winterfell Library before it burned down. One of them was about dragons. He's been interested in dragons forever. His whole life, his whole life, he's been very interested in dragons, dragon dreams, that whole thing. So that's probably one of the big ways that Tyrion is going to build rapport with Danny, is um, you know helping quell the violence, but also any help that he can give her because remember, Danny's really tormented by her inability to control the dragons with Hosea. Yeah, she's locked the other two up because of it. So because she's only she's only ever known what like Viserys has taught her, and he didn't know anything about dragons really. So she's just kind of been winging it. She's a single mom. Give her a break. <laughs> and of course, there's even an outside chance that Tyrion could start to perhaps even bond with one of the dragons. But I think we're going to talk about that more in the Tyrion in the episode. Tyrion section. So our next question is going to be examining that very interesting dynamic between Sir Barristan, Victarion, and Tyrion. So if either Victarion or Tyrion can help control the dragons, they gain political power, and both of them have different ways they can go about doing that. Of course, Victarion has the dragon binder, which we don't know the exact effects of that, but like there's the potential, obviously. And then Tyrion's knowledge could be useful in like steering Daenerys in the right direction as to like how to control these wild beasts, because she clearly needs some help in you know, that lane. That's right, because that's kind of what this is all about. It's a contest to win favor and rapport with Danny. Like Victorian and the Ironborn, he's coming there ostensibly to win Danny over for Euron, and he plans on doing it himself. But either way, he's trying to establish rapport with Danny. Quentin tried, and he mm-hmm. tried and failed. He tried and died. Yeah, but you know, yeah. <laughs> Do you know, a shout out. Yeah, but you know, Victorian has a lot to offer. He really does. He does. Right? He's got the ships, he's got the dragon binder. Um, yeah, so he's got a lot. It's good. He's probably going to play an instrumental role in, in winning the battle, as well as just having the ships to transport her home. So, yeah. So, and then of course Tyrion has has the ability to help bring the dragon knowledge. Now, the thing is about Barry, Vic, and Tyrion is that all three do know of each other somewhat. Um, but they don't know each other. Yeah, Tyrion is the thing that that people know the least about because Tyrion's capabilities came to the fore in King's Landing kind of after Barristan was kicked out, mm-hmm. and Victorian doesn't know too much about that. And he's also not been credited, really. That's also true. Mm-hmm. A lot of, yeah, he hasn't, you're right, he hasn't been credited yeah. at all. But, so, everyone knows Barristan, right? Mm-hmm. Barristan is Legendary. a legend. So he's instantly going to have rapport. Even Victorian would have grudging respect, although they were on opposite sides of the battle at Old Wick during the Great Joel Rebellion. Yes. And... You know how those kind of soldiers are. Like, they respect each other even if they're enemies just Absolutely. because of valor. So I would say of everybody, Tyrion will have to prove himself the most. Probably so, yep. All he has is his wits. And so the main thing here is that this, t- this sort of new team of Danny would-be um, you know, allies are going to end up having to work together to win this battle. And ba- again, Barristan's already seeing the Ironborn sails out in the bay, mm-hmm. so he's going to appreciate what's going on. And as soon as Tyrion surfaces, you know, he's, he is, I mean, Tyrion is, is pretty awesome actually here because he shows up in Slaver's Bay and without ever talking to Danny, he's already like acting in concert with her interests by turning the second sons over. Yeah. So that's again going to help him as far as, you know, establishing rapport and proving his worth. Like he's bringing the second sons over. So that's a good start, right? 
Exactly. All right. And, you know, it's also important to think about how long they'll have to wait before Daenerys returns from the Dothraki Sea. Yeah, because it could be a while. D- d- as we're going to cover in, you know, the Danny episode in the Dothraki Sea, there's a lot of things that still have to happen. So, mm-hmm. uh, and in that meantime, that's kind of leads us to our next question. What is Tyrion going to do with power until Danny returns? Because as we said, Tyrion has the most to prove and his skills besides the dragon knowledge are all political. And there's a lot of political problems that are going to be present in the wake of, you know, even if they do win this battle, which I assume they will, they're yeah. going to have a lot of problems to deal with. So I think that Tyrion potentially helping Danny solve this problem with the Sons of the Harpy, I mean, that's perfect for Tyrion because he's all about, um, you know, the political scheming and stuff. That, that was all Clash of Kings. That's what he was doing. So solving this mystery is the perfect job for him, and I think that'll help him prove himself to Daenerys a lot. Yeah, and I don't think the Harpy Sons will be done necessarily no. after this. There's still going to be resistance, you know, pockets of resistance there always is, mm-hmm. especially there. And we haven't gotten to the heart of that yet, so we'll need to, like, unravel that. Yeah, that's true. We still don't know technically, like, even how culpable Hisdar was in the whole plot. He seems culpable because of the time he didn't eat the locusts or whatever, but... I don't know. The Green Grace is definitely yeah. this big suspect, and we don't know what Shave Pate's deal is. In fact, Tyrion might start executing people like his star or Shave Pate, whoever he decides is. I mean, Tyrion doesn't have any attachment to anyone. He's definitely more ruthless than Danny. Definitely. Yeah, I think the fact that he is—he's removed from this whole situation. You know, he's not. It's not. It has nothing to do with the Lannisters or Westeros or anybody he knows. So he can kind of like take a step back and just kind of examine it the way it is, which will be very useful because he, the way he handled Cersei's scheming and plots and like kind of like smoking everything out will work here, I think. It's perfect for him. Yeah, definitely. Because I was listening to A Dance with Dragons, uh, the Danny chapters in particular, recently, and you can definitely see the Miranese kind of hemming her in and playing games with her, mm-hmm. you know, between the Shave Pate and uh, the Seneschal Resnack. There's it's, and the green grace. It's just they're showing her all these ideas and emotions, and oh, you can't do this, and oh, you got to do that, and you just feel like they're trying to box her in mm-hmm. and steer her towards this moment with the poison locust in the square, and so she needs someone like Tyrion that can step in and be like, okay, no, this is you need to, this is what you need to do. Tyrion just plain old has the experience that mm-hmm. Danny lacks here, so exactly going to be invaluable and. There's always the outside chance, you know, like I mentioned real quick, that Tyrion not only having dragon knowledge, but maybe making contact with the dragons. Um, Viserion in particular, in the end of the Tyrion Tiwau chapter, is that really cool part that we were just talking about uh, the other day, where the, one of the Sybast pieces, the white yes. dragon, falls off and gets blood in the veins of the wood, and it ends up looking... You know, weirwoodish, kind of weirwoodish, kind of, and it's a white dragon. He picks it up and he's like contemplating. He's like, hmm, dragons, white dragons, oh, that's interesting. Mm. <laughs> so, you know, maybe we'll see Tyrion in the show. You remember there was that moment where he sort of, you know, he touched the dragon, touched the and, dragon and, and we were all like, wondering, ah, Tyrion Targaryen. They didn't do anything with it, but yeah, they didn't go too far with it. Who knows? And whether or not Tyrion is a Targaryen, there's no question that dragons are a major theme of his sort of plot arc oh, and happened from the beginning. Yeah. So. Look for a little little Tyrion dragon moment, perhaps. So our next thing is, we all know that Victarion plans on proposing to Daenerys and getting her hand in marriage. So the question is, how soon is he going to announce this? Because I can't really see any benefit of him going in and telling Varysen and Tyrion and being like, I intend on marrying Daenerys. It would make more sense to wait till she gets back and ask her. Yeah, because... You know, he's. I think he's got to stick with his ostensible plan. Like, Euron is the one that has the standing yes. to make a marriage proposal to mm-hmm. Daenerys. A Victarion would essentially have to displace Euron. I, of course, we don't know how far ahead Vic has made any of these plans. Vic's not exactly... He's not the smartest. He's not no. exactly Illyrio and Varys or uh, Peter Baelish. Mm-hmm. But in any case, some people think that Euron is, like, literally going to appear as soon as the horn is blown... And that, and Euron will be there in a flash. I don't. I tend to think Euron, he's doing stuff in Old Town with that naval battle that we're going to talk about. And I, I, yeah. I, I think that it's just it's probably going to be likely that Victarion and Danny make it back to Westeros before Euron pulls the rug out from under Vic, which we all know is coming. I tend to agree. I tend to think that Euron is thinking in advance. He's already got Victarion in check. He, he's not worried. Or otherwise, he wouldn't have sent him. Well, clearly, he's got that's. There's no question about yeah. that, right? Is the dusky woman the spy? Mm-hmm. But in any case, what we're curious about is 
the level of subterfuge that Victorian will be able to employ and how that's going to roll. Because if he does roll in, it's just like, I'm here to marry Daenerys. Like, I don't know. That won't be the best that way to go about it. That won't be the best way, no. That's, so this is, again, the three-way political you know, issues. Like, we're going to get to see Victorian doing something other than swinging an axe. And it will definitely be high comedy, whatever happens. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sure George will have fun writing that. Right. And so this is one of the reasons why we think all three of these characters are going to survive. Mm-hmm. Because it's just too much fun to have Victarion talk to Tyrion and talk to Barristan. Yeah. I mean, it's just as a writer, you don't forego three, chances like that. These three so. characters have to interact. It's going to be too good. So yes. I, that's where I think this is going. And then so next question how will Makoro influence things? So Makoro is also a pretty big wild card, I think, right? So he's sent by Benero to bring the faith of her lord to Daenerys Targaryen. Um, and he seems to be using Victarion as a, as a means to get to, da- to Danny. And he's not only that, but he's been with both Victarion and Tyrion. Mm-hmm. Uh, he started off with Tyrion on that ship, but then it got blown apart and he spent 10 days in the ocean and got scooped out of the sea by Victarion, who now has two gods and stuff. So yes. Benero has, uh, not Benero, um, but Makor rather, sent by Benero, has a very interesting angle on all of this. And he's been planting ideas in both of their heads. He seems to be a more advanced red priest. I mean, maybe Melisandre could survive 10 days in the ocean. I guess it's possible, but... Makoro is pretty ace, so he's definitely not to be underestimated. It seems like he he just looks at things a little differently than Melisandre, where she's like very like locked into a box with her interpretation. He's just kind of seeing things as they are. Seems that way. Um, again, I'm just dying to see what his actual agenda turns out to be. Yeah, he could even be working with Euron, to be honest. I mean, that's not Euron? impossible. Yeah. So there was, um, you know, when he saw Tyrion. When he met Tyrion, he saw him in a vision, and he said, you know, dragons old and young, true and false, bright and dark, and you, a small man with a big shadow, snarling in the midst of all. So that's more of that idea that dragons are a big part of Tyrion's arc, but Makoro specifically sees Tyrion as important. Yes, big shadow, right? And, you know, that's one of the earliest times that we see Tyrion in Game of Thrones, and George is talking about his big shadow. And I always took that to mean, like, Tyrion's influence over all this. He'll have great influence over all this stuff that's going on with the dragons. Yeah, there's no question. And like I said, whether or not he's a Targaryen, that's going to be the case. Mm -hmm. And similarly, Makoro has told Victarion that he's very important. Oh, yeah. The Lord of Light has shown me your worth, Lord Captain. Every night in my fires, I glimpse the glory that awaits you. And that's one of those lines that could be read a couple different ways, like, oh, I see you in my fires every night, and the Lord of Light has shown me your worth. Yeah. Worth a lot as a sacrifice, maybe. So. <laughs> yeah, I tend to see that as more ominous. More ominous. But yeah. the point is, Makoro has identified Vic as an important player, just Absolutely. like Tyrion. Yeah. And so Makoro is going to be paying attention, making moves, pulling strings, and we've got to keep an eye on what he's doing. Mm-hmm. And then the other one is that Makoro also has seen Euron in a vision that he relayed to Victarion, and he described him as um, a shadow, one most of all, a tall and twisted thing with one black eye. Ten long arms sailing on a sea of blood. And he says one most of all. So that means like Euron is like the biggest, you know, threat and the most formidable player in this whole game, whatever's going on here. And sailing on a sea of blood, I mean, we, we do see the blood sea symbolism suggested at Old Town, where mm-hmm. we are, of course, atop the high tower. Yes. Um, with the whole, all the blood <laughs> sacrifice that he's getting ready to do in the ocean. But sailing on a sea of blood also sounds like he might be on his way. Yes. You know, coming for yeah. Victarion at some point. So, you know, I see a ship in the harbor. It could, <laughs> it could be the silence. We'll have to see. It'd be epic, but, you know, we never know what George R. R. Martin's going to do. So to summarize things, the Westerosi powers are probably going to end up winning and ending up in some kind of uneasy alliance uh, waiting for Daenerys to return. The Ironborn are there to obviously, you know, get Daenerys back to Westeros and, you know, Tyrion... And Barristan and Victorian are going to be hanging out in the city. And, you know, you got Tyrion who might rule with, you know, more severe me- measures because he has gone darker. And that's a question we'll look at in the Tyrion episode. Mm-hmm. And then there's also Marwyn, who's also on his way to the nearest, apparently. Yet another wild card. And I could do a whole episode on Marwyn, I guess. But if you're familiar with me and my Marwyn ideas, it's basically really simple. Just we meet him in... You know, in the Citadel, Mm -hmm. he's been using a glass candle to keep an eye on everything at the North. Mm -hmm. He is 
some one of the few characters who understands the White Walkers are the real threat, and who understands that you know he, uh, we need an Azor High Reborn hero. He's looking at Danny, mm-hmm. and basically where we leave off with Marwyn, he's leaving town to go find Danny and give her advice okay. because she, she should have a maester and she doesn't. So the question is, uh, you know. The glass candle he's using there wasn't the only one. There's more in the Citadel Mm -hmm. that doesn't seem like they're used very often because nobody believes in magic. So if you're Marwyn the Maester, Marwyn the Mage rather, Marwyn the Maester Mage, do you take a glass candle with you to help the savior win the last battle? Like, of course you do. It's like too powerful a thing to leave at home. Yes. Right. So, yeah, a glass candle is is incredibly useful. And he could show Daenerys all sorts of things with that. I wonder if he'll appear to her before he actually gets to her through the glass candle. Like He Quaid could. Has. He could make contact her while she's still out in the in the Dothraki Sea mm-hmm. and help guide her back. That makes sense to me. Uh, and the main thing is that I think eventually Danny will end up using it. Yeah, because Danny is the Valerian here. And I just want to see her keep leveling up. To all the way to full scale Valerian sorceress, mm-hmm. you know, hopefully not like you know human sacrifice. I thought about potentially too what w- what could happen if Danny blew the dragon binder, right? Since everybody else burns up, she's Valerian. Maybe she doesn't. Maybe she doesn't. And there's one of those no man, you know, mm-hmm. kind of <laughs> yes. sounded and lived. No whatever. man am I. Yes, just we can. There's no, there's no <laughs> limit to how many times people can uh, quote that one from Tolkien. Yes, but yeah, Danny could. I've thought about that. Danny mm-hmm. could blow the horn potentially and live. Um, and as far as the glass candle goes, I think that it's possible if you that that's how she could go to a shy. If you remember, yes. George used to say that he planned for her to go to a shy, and then he canceled that plan. Mm-hmm. And Quave used to be trying to draw her there, saying, "Well, what's waiting for you there? Truth is waiting for you there." Well, you can discover truth via a glass candle, exactly. you know, spooky vision, and that's a better way to keep a shy mysterious, anyway. So yeah, that makes the most sense. I think her seeing a shy through a glass candle. I think we've talked about that a bunch, me and you. And, it, and it's going to be kind of Barristan style, where Marwyn's going to show up probably in disguise and take the scope of the land, and we're just going to find out that he's there in the room one mm. time. And yeah, so Starry Wisdom, con- Starry Wisdom conspiracy video incoming. Mm. At some I've point. got something to say about this. Who's this guy? Tomorrow. <laughs> Who is he? <laughs> All right. Well, that about does it for the Battle of Fire. You get the idea of where we're going with this. Um, it's just a matter of kind of waiting for Danny to get back and. Getting all the forces together, getting on those ships and heading home. I mean, there's, again, there's not really much, it's not really, and she needs a fleet, Mm -hmm. here's a fleet, you know, it's definitely the one she's going to use. Yep, but first she's got to finish her vision quest over in the east, so we'll see how that works out. (laughs) That's right, and the second video, the next one, which will be over on my channel, is going to be the one about Tyrion and Danny. we're calling that Hand of the Dragon, and we're basically going to take a look at all the factors that are going to play into that very important relationship when they'll meet, what'll be at play there. How they'll influence each other, potentially. That's right. How Tyrion is not necessarily going to be the good angel on the shoulder that he is on the show. Like, no, Danny, don't do that. That would be bad. Tyrion's <laughs> a cynical guy, and we'll talk about this more in, in the next video as well. So don't miss that. Make sure you're subscribed to both of our channels, and we'll see you next time. Thank you guys so much for watching. <laughs>